You picked another winner, Josh. <laughs> oh my god. Welcome to Screens of the Stone Age, the podcast where scientists review movies about prehistoric people. I'm Josh Lindell. I'm a grad student studying Neanderthal teeth, and I'm here with... I'm Dr. Kimberly Pomp. I am a bioarchaeologist. I study the human skeleton, health and disease, and evolution. And I'm Dr. Ross Barnett, a paleogeneticist looking at the evolution of the cat. And today we're reviewing a movie called Master of the World from... 1983. Master of the World is the English translation. This is an Italian movie that is pretty obscure. I've never heard of it before I added it to I our list. Why. I assume you hadn't heard of it either. No, it doesn't <laughs> seem well known. <laughs> now, y- you say that this is not a well known movie and that it's not a very good movie, but this is the best kind of movie for our podcast. Uh. It uh has a lot to talk about uh I know. it's like some of the movies we watch are pretty tangential to the stone age but this is the like 1970s 1980s like caveman exploitation era <laughs> of movies yeah the thing is, is there's just no storyline to speak of at least i didn't get it it was way too art house no. things for me like it was way of it i have no idea what was happening most of the time it was too art house, and it wasn't also also it wasn't art house enough, and that the people were still wearing clothes. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the worst of both worlds. It's it's uh, arty in terms of acting, but there's no kind of Game of Thrones style uh, nudity on display either. So, and even the one sex scene, they like hardly started, <laughs> it and then and to a video of blue herons having sex. Yeah. I think they were having we've got, to, we've got to talk about herons at some point, because uh, there was way more herons in this film than I expected, which was none. I expected yeah. none and saw several dozen um, <laughs> with sort of very badly uh, composited stock footage inserted at various points. I mean, this, this film almost had more stock footage than actual footage, I feel. Um, I think it did, yeah. Yeah, and cheap stock footage at that. And it was so like, Obviously, yeah, cheap and old and probably free because it was all different, like grain and like yeah. the grain and the color and just everything was so different. It was like, if you told me you have to make a move and you have to try and make it look professional, I'd be like, okay, I need monkeys. I'd go on YouTube and I'd find a video of a monkey and I'd try and take a video of that and I'd throw it in. Like, that's what it was like, right? Yeah, <sighs> totally. And just all sorts of, I mean, the, the sort of, uh, the zoologist in me was like, my God, this this is a global film. It's got uh, biota from <laughs> Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from the Americas. It's just it's the Garden of Eden, essentially. It's 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 um you know everything yeah. is in it, pretty much. If the Garden of Eden was just full of jerks, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so who wants to try to summarize the plot of this movie? I can't. I have no idea. I can try, but it'll be ridiculous. <laughs> Wait, okay, do you want me to go? Because I'll only take two minutes, and then Ross can like actually yeah. sum it up. Let's, let's do it. Okay. Do it. <laughs> so, there are different... There's like a, a... starts with a narrator who's talking about God and different races of people, and how we used to get along, and there is... Everybody, but everybody, the one thing everybody had in common was they worship bears. Then it cuts to this scene where this one group of people has a bear skull, obviously in a place of prominence, and then another group of people come and they fight and then they steal, they kill some people and they steal the bear skull or head, souls for on it, and they run away. Then it loses me. So we're a minute and a half in. And then <laughs> there's there's just warring tribes, which I think some of them Neanderthals and some of them are Homo sapiens. And the the guys who stole the bear skull seem to be Neanderthals and they have a homo sapien man tied to a tree. And then the female Neanderthal takes pity on him and says, we shouldn't kill him. And so she tries to save him and then her tribe leaves her. And then it's just her and him, but he's a huge jerk to her, but she seems to love him. (laughs) And then they just walk around and then there's just groups that just start fighting each other. And sometimes they steal the, bear's head but i have no idea i can't keep track of that the same groups are all different groups or what's happening and then they meet this modern human female 
And then the modern human man has sex with the modern human female and then Neanderthal woman sees, so then it breaks her heart. So then she gets mad, but then she doesn't really do anything. And then there's more fighting. And then eventually the Neanderthal woman gets murdered or killed in the fighting. And then the homo sapien woman has a baby. And then I, I lost track of whether the homo sapien man died at the end. No, no. He holds them up like Lion no. King. Yeah, yeah. He holds the baby up like Lion King. <laughs> and then that's the end, I think. That's pretty much what I got out of it as well. I mean, it's really confusing because, you know, not to be speciesist, but everyone looks the bloody same. Like, there's yeah. no differentiation <laughs> between, you know, the Homo sapiens, I think, are all kind of grubby and uh, unkempt and, and blonde, I think. Yeah. But the Neanderthals are also grubby and unkempt and, and brunette, possibly. But it's not made clear because there's a blonde Neanderthal as well. I, think. I know, and, they, and there's sometimes when they show the faces, and you can see the like prosthetic like brow ridges and stuff, and you're like, okay, so that's a Neanderthal. Yeah. But most of the scenes, the hair is just in the way; you can't see anything, so you totally. don't know who's fighting who. I kind of wish yeah. Frack or, for that. Or why? Yeah, but remember that movie that we kind of made fun of it, um, the one with the the famous blonde woman with the tiny skin, hide bikini, the famous poster yeah, one. Yeah, but one million years BC, Raquel Welch. Yeah. Yeah. How we. We were like teased it. We we made fun of it because there was one tribe that was blonde, one tribe that was brunette, right? But that mm. did make it easier to tell who was who during yeah. the fight scenes. Yeah. <laughs> and also in one million years BC, they could talk. I think a real kind of oh. problem with this film was that nobody could talk at all. Like the Neanderthals sounded like chimps. <clears throat> all I know. they do is like make excited pants and hoots. Chimp noises. And the the, the Homo sapiens. All he can say is Bog, which is his name, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Uh, which is a rubbish name. I mean, I don't know yeah. if it's the same in Canada, but in the UK, Bog is slang for and he toilet. Never her name. No, he doesn't care. <laughs> he treats her abysmally. This this lovely Neanderthal uh, girl who who saved him from from death, and he's like, "Yeah, get out of my way, bitch." Uh, he just doesn't care about her at all. He's horrible. He is horrible. I don't know. We're not. No one in this film is particularly likable, except maybe the the uh, new girl, that's how I've described her throughout my notes, who's the homo sapiens woman who somehow takes a liking to him. Uh, the Neanderthal has, woman is fine. Uh, she's nice. She's yeah, just the Neanderthal woman is life. nice, yeah. She's nice, but she's a bit of a, you know, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a mat. Um, a doormat. Door like, she gets walked all over. Yeah. Although he was a jerk to the homo sapien woman, too, and she, like, bowed to him or something. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty sexist. His idea of a foreplay was uh, poking her with a spear. Um, I yeah. thought that was <laughs> how we didn't go extinct. I I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, the, it's not just like simply like Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. There's different groups of Neanderthals, I think, who have antagonism as well, and different groups mm. of Homo sapiens. And because there's no actual dialogue, there's no talking. I, you just don't have a clue what's going on. It's just like, it's just classic. All these people are fighting for reasons and then they go away and then they come back and fight some more for the same reasons, different reasons. I don't know. For, the bear, for the bear head. head. Yeah. But then also they're not because, you know, there's a bear that appears at times as well. You didn't mention the bear, Kim. Yeah. The real bear. Right, sorry. So which, he fights which kind of, the bear like two or three times. Which morphs into a, a man in a very rubbish uh, suit <laughs> for close-ups, yeah. where you can see the zip and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And even in the wide shots, it's very obvious that the bear has a, a total muzzle on to prevent it from doing any damage. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm pretty sure this, this film would not have passed uh, the... Who is it that does the animal certifications in modern films? Uh the the sort of animal defense league or whatever this would not have got a certificate from them yeah no uh, yeah it's very a very disappointing film there, i mean i, I was and it was so long oh yeah totally long <laughs> josh and i i guess you guys watched this on the 2b link that i sent you but i couldn't figure out how to change the speed i wanted i never watched them on 1.5 oh. but i wanted to for this one i yeah. did i watched it at 1.5 and i st it still was so long like there were scenes where i was like this is a very long scene and i have it at 1.5 the tubi uh didn't work in the uk even sad sadder mm. so i had to find it on a different site which didn't have the option of speeding it up so i had to watch the whole thing at normal speed i had to get a vpn thing 
and then watch Tubi because I couldn't find it anywhere else. Yeah, it's it was it was dreadful, and it just made no sense at any point. It's just just that kind of classic cave exploitation, just random people fighting for reasons that are incomprehensible. Um, and I you think know, my favorite part so it was when they just like punched into the whole heads so easily like their eggshells <laughs> and then just started ripping their brains out which was gooey and they all just ate the brains those are the scenes delicious the reason why i thought about it is those are the scenes that lasted so long like five minutes of them just eating gooey brains mm. and i had it on 1.5 <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll have to give them props their their head um their disembodied heads were pretty good they looked actually like yeah. like real heads the brains yeah. just looked like you know pudding yes and it would be harder to get into a human skull than that and it would also be a lot harder to decapitate people especially with the tools that they were using so they had they had yeah. uh daggers and they were holding them the wrong way around i'm sure uh josh will have plenty there, to say about was, that but he, even at the end of the last one he was using the hand axe and had like the pointy sharp bit in the other direction it was using the like rounded like base <laughs> yeah. bit to chop the, the head off yeah Ugh. Uh, we definitely have to talk about the the flint that they used in the in the film. Okay, so let's that's enough of a summary, I guess. Let's just get into the details because despite <laughs> not really having a plot, this is one of these movies where we can find the inspiration behind every little bit and we can talk about a lot of real life stuff that it's related to, I think. So mm -hmm. let's spend most of our time doing that. Uh, let's start with the stone tools. The one that stuck out to me the most was towards the end, there's a guy sharpening his spear, which is a chipped stone point, but he's using a grinding stone like he's sharpening a metal knife, which is not how you would sharpen a chipped stone blade. You would sharpen it by chipping it more to get another a cleaner chipped edge on it. Uh, ground, ground stone tools don't really appear until I think like the Neolithic, right? Yeah. For your Neolithic yeah. polished axes and stuff, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they're modern human. <laughs> what else do we have to say about this, the stone tools? Beholding them the wrong way around <laughs> yeah. was pretty bad. I thought the Acheulean had that looked pretty good, but again, it was mm. hard to see one because I was watching at 1.5, but also just, they didn't seem to really focus on anything right? Like the no. scenes were always, there was so much kind of going on in movement that it was hard to really see anything. Yeah. And none of them had, as far as I reckon, they had flints, they had like uh, daggers, uh, they had mm -hmm. fire hardened wooden spears. So we could talk about that, mm -hmm. but none of them had hafted weapons mm -hmm. as far as I could tell. None of them had the, mm -hmm. the stone attached to the wood. It was just fire hardened mm -hmm. uh, spears, which yeah, have a long I pedigree. So I did a bit of reading up on this, and the oldest spear that we know of, the oldest wooden spear, the Clacton spear, which is from southern England, it is fire hardened. So that's just where they kind of hold it over mm -hmm. the fire to get the moisture out of the wood. Which I mean, I think it's Josh will be able to sort of jump in and tell us a bit more, but uh, it, it helps to harden it and make it sharper if if it's fire exposed. I don't, I don't know that I can tell you much more than that because I don't specialize in stone tools, but uh, I know that fire hardening is a thing. I think that helps it preserve better too because it sort of carbonizes it a bit, so it helps mm -hmm. us uh, find them better. How old is that one though, uh, I think the one that you mentioned? 400,000 uh, plus a bit. Mm. The other ones that I know of are the Schoeningen Spears from Germany, which are also about 400,000. So yeah. the movie, I don't know if we mentioned, is uh, there's a voiceover at the beginning that says it's set 200,000 years ago. So in terms of the timeline, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You'd have modern humans and Neanderthals at that time. Uh, I've seen the Schoeningen mm -hmm. Spears. I've been to Schoeningen. I gave a, a lecture there um, 10 years ago now. Um, but they have a fantastic museum which has all the stuff from showing in on display. So the spears and, and the lithics and the animal bones. And they're actually, they are really impressive. They're not just like tiny wee branches. They're, they're like complete trees, pretty much really big um, spears, which would have been considerably lethal. I would have thought mm. and used for hunting horses, given the, the bones that are, that are there as well. So yeah, that was cool. Very cool. The modern human guy also made, I don't know names of weapons, but that, where he bolas. made the three balls. Bolas, yeah. He made one of those too. <laughs> Which I don't know what the timeline <laughs> for bolas is, but just the, the again, like Kim, you were saying, like, all these really long scenes, which were just totally boring. His invention yeah. of the bolas 
just sort of came out of nowhere and had nothing to do with his <laughs> yeah. kind of inspiration. So his inspiration was he was fighting a guy with a spear and he had his slingshot, which, yeah, is a very useful weapon, though he's pretty crap at it. He doesn't manage to hit the, the Pika, which he's trying to hit in the stock footage that we're shown. But he, he's <laughs> really kind of flailing around with this empty slingshot while this guy's got a, a, a huge bloody wooden spear that he's trying to prod him with. Uh, and he kind of slaps the, the, the slingshot, this sort of leather strip, and it kind of wraps around the spear. And from that wrapping around, he somehow gets the idea, oh yeah, why don't we just put stones in it uh, to make it heavy at the <laughs> ends, and then we can throw it and it will uh, wrap around people's necks and kill them. So yeah, good for him. Yeah. It should have gone right to Indiana's whip, right? <laughs> that should have been. Yeah, that, that, that's the direction it looked like it was going. Yeah. There's a similar kind of epiphany that the Neanderthal girl has where early in the movie, she's collecting leaves to make like a poultice to treat this guy's wound. And she sees mm -hmm. these berries on the ground and it's like really ominous. And you're like, why the fuck are these berries so ominous, right? Mm -hmm. But then it comes back to it later, exactly the same berries on the ground. And she has this revelation like, wait a minute, there's berries on the ground. There's little trees growing out of the ground. And then she's like, berries, trees, berries, trees. And she's like, trees grow from berries. And then she tries to tell several people this, including our hero later. And they're all like, fuck off. <laughs> I don't care about this. And wow. like nothing comes of it. on them. Yeah, one of them stomps on the trees. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I did not get that at all. I, I didn't was get like, that are either. They poisonous berries. It's, like what's it, happening? Yeah, it, it's so hard to figure out what anything means because there's no language. But uh, I like that's what my impression was: is she's learning how plants grow. But like it, nothing that doesn't make any difference in the movie. She just dies in the end without anybody ever caring about that. Hmm. I, I thought maybe the berries were poisonous because there's a. I mean, as you say, everything is totally confusing. The the blonde mm. Neanderthal who's who's a, a bit of an arsehole and who stamps on her lovely little uh, trees that are growing, she's rescuing him or kind of at some point she has to save him. Why he's a dick? Why not just leave him to die? And it looks like mm. she she's kind of collects berries and gives them to him and all of his group. And then there's a scene where uh, two of the Neanderthals are are puking blood. <laughs> I, I don't I, I don't know what that's going on They're there. They're both children. I don't know if that's yeah. relevant. Yeah. But you know what? They reminded me of this scene. A lot of this movie reminded me of the movie Iron Master, which was also another great movie that I recommended or that I suggested, having never seen it. Uh, but there's a scene in that movie which does have language, uh, which makes it easier to follow, where our uh, main our main character discovers that branches are springy. And he's like, sproing, sproing, sproing. And he's like, I wonder if we could do something All with right. this. And he's like, nah. And then like this, like the kid from that movie is later. He's like, hey, you know what? We could use these springy branches to make a weapon. And he's like, ha oh, ha ha, you stupid child. And then later on steals his idea. Like, oh yeah, we could make bows and arrows out of these. But like the revel like the scene of discovering um, this thing has these properties. And it's just like, you know, it's like sproing. Sproing, sproing. <laughs> it's like, like trying to like uh, depict in film the idea of having a thought, you know. <laughs> but there's a reason why these two movies are similar because uh, they're the uh, I think the director of this movie, Alberto Cavallone, Cavallone. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's the writer of this movie and he also has a writing credit on, uh, Iron Master, which came out the mm. same year okay. as this movie. So, uh, that's why we see some similarities, I think. Right. Mm. Uh, we could talk a bit about cannibalism. That might be quite Okay, let's talk about cannibalism. <laughs> we glossed over all the brain eating. There's a lot of brain there eating. There is a lot of yeah, brain there's eating. There's a lot of brain eating. Uh, and it, it's yeah. I think they 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 sort of got it right in that it's it's done for ritual reasons. It seems like they don't they're not mm -hmm. hungry. They're doing it for cultural practices, I guess. And there is a lot of evidence in the fossil yeah. record for for that in Neanderthals mm -hmm. and in uh, modern humans and in mm -hmm. modern humans eating Neanderthals. So yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. Do we have evidence for modern humans eating Neanderthals? There, there is a bit. So there's, there's a site in France where uh, defleshed, cut, marked Neanderthal bones are found in a, a midden essentially, which has 
Homo sapien lithic technology uh, in it, along with other prey items like deer and boar and stuff. So it looks like A, the sort of stones show that it was modern humans, and B, uh, it shows that the Neanderthals were treated the same as other prey items um, and then discarded after being eaten. So in that case, it looks like hmm. that is kind of consumption for for calories rather than for culture, uh, which is interesting. Right. But certainly there, there's definitely a, a good amount of evidence for cultural cannibalism um, in Homo sapiens amongst Homo sapiens and in Neanderthals amongst Even Neanderthals. Today. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cannibalism, it's um, stigmatized as a taboo in a lot of cultures, but in a lot of other cultures, even including today, it's um, generally like a cultural ritualistic thing. And I think the only time that modern humans generally consume other human flesh for calories is in extreme circumstances like the Dahmer expedition or the Dahmer, uh, it wasn't an expedition, but the uh, Donner, the sorry. Donner, Donner. Yeah. Donner. 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 Yeah. Yeah. He did it too, but it's very different. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then that, uh, <laughs> that airline crash mm. in the Andes, like things like that, horrific things. But then there's other, there's other things like there's um, people in South America that, you know, they'll consume, well, there's people all, all over the world, but the one I'm thinking of in particular, they'll consume the flesh, especially of an infant that dies the mom will consume the entire baby because she sees it as taking it back into herself to keep it safe. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, she would be horrified at the idea of having to bury it in a cemetery and leave it. Yeah. Right? Cold and alone in the ground. So, yeah, I think I, I appreciated that it wasn't like a gore, like they made it gory, but it was more, seemed like um, a ritualistic thing after war right yeah. and almost like that idea that, and there's a lot of um ethnographic things too where you actually consume the flesh of someone that you respected like in like a enemy warrior or something with the idea that you would take on some of their strength or intelligence or whatever absolutely yeah taking on part of their spirit or their soul or something that yeah make, and that sense. almost seems like this too because they didn't eat everybody that they killed they only seemed to eat the the leaders, right? They're the bigger guys. The, the ones with the best brains. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was quite nicely done, I thought. Yeah, the the the, the uh, it was gory and the, the kind of props were pretty good for the, the minimal budget, I'm guessing, that they had. Uh, and they at least made the mm -hmm. brains look like the kind of gloopy soup that they would be. Um, the kind of <laughs> uh, pudding consistency that it would, would have. Um, and yeah, it did. I don't think it would be. I think brains aren't really goopy. They're a little bit Not more as goopy solid. as they're like showing. It come it, out it, more like a, no, it'd come out more like a sponge cake, right? Hmm, yeah. Then <laughs> a, a kind of salty, bloody uh, sponge cake. <laughs> yeah. I've always heard it described as like uh, like tapioca or something when it's non embalmed. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like I've heard it described as jello. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I've probably mostly seen it embalmed. But I guess you know there there are, there, there, I guess the reason why lots of cultures also have taboos against cannibalism is that it's not a fantastic idea from a um, disease spreading point of view and the, and uh, there's the the kind of the classic story of the um of the foray in in papua new guinea who are uh, mm -hmm. a, a group mm -hmm. that practice cannibalism uh, and they they actually got uh, a horrible disease passed amongst them called kuru or laughing sickness which mm -hmm. was a prion disease so like uh kreutzfeldt jakob or or mad cow disease bse uh, it's like a, mm -hmm. a, a misfolded protein that can be transferred by consumption, um, just like mm -hmm. all the burgers that I had in the 90s um, in the UK. And uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's, that's why, because obviously you're, if you eat something which has a disease from the same species as you, then you can get that disease, whether it's a prion, whether it's a virus, whether it's a bacteria. Um, it's not yeah. super sensible. Yeah. But I mean, the, the sort of, Given that there's like what eight billion humans on the on the planet now, it's almost a surprise that there's not more cannibalism than there is. Well, that's the thing is that there's not more cannibalism when people come to look, right? So, like, yeah. there's a lot of suggestion that, um, especially you know, people would be practicing cannibalism, and then colonizers would come and tell them that that was wrong, and be offended by it, and then they would leave. And then when they came back, also nobody was practicing cannibalism anymore. But it was just you. Just, <laughs> they started to hide behavior, right? Mm -hmm. That was 
yeah. frowned upon by the colonialists doesn't mean that it necessarily stopped. And it's not, it's not, you know, it never goes, it's never going to go away. Um, certainly in terms of, in terms of uh, nutritional stress, like you, you hear stories from uh, oh. places like Stalingrad during World War II and, uh, and other kind of times and places fairly recently where, uh, particularly in war zones where, where it's happened through necessity as well. Yeah, definitely. If, if, and this just goes out to everybody that if you're with me and we're in a horrible situation and, and I die, I have to be dead first. Feel free to eat me. That's fine. Yeah. Eat Please me. don't kill me to eat me. Yeah. But, you know, like it's, that's fine. Right. Like, and I think it, the people in the, at the, on that um, plane crash, once they realized what they were going to have to do, they also gave permission. Right. Mm. There's another film, I think just about to be released, maybe on Netflix or maybe in the cinema about, about that mm. because there, there's been a few articles in the newspapers recently with uh, interviews with um, survivors. I think yeah. it's out because I think I came across it on Netflix uh, about a week ago and okay. added it to my list already. Mm. I didn't watch it I yet, just listened though. to it. The last podcast on the left, left just, did, <laughs> just did covers of it. It was good. Um, and what they said from this podcast was they said that the two women that were on the, there was like a wife and a daughter and they didn't eat those the two women just out of respect because the father or the husband or somebody, the living male relative, because it was, then it was all males after they died, like said, we can't eat them. Okay. So the, they didn't sexism and cannibalism. <laughs> I think it was out of respect to the, the request of the person that died. Like okay. you can eat me once I die, but don't eat them. Right. right. <sighs> I think um, you're wrong about, I think it was that did a good, uh, the cover of uh, good coverage of the that whole story as well. Yeah, it's a good podcast too. Okay, do we want to do sort of a rapid fire animals mistakes in this movie? <laughs> There's a lot of animals, Absolutely. a lot of herons. Yep. <laughs> Go for it. What do we got? How many animals do we have? How many are in the wrong place? Well, where are we? By the way, the movie is filmed in the Canary Islands. I assume it takes place in Europe or the Middle East because of. Um, uh, ne modern humans and Neanderthals interacting. I guess we'd have to, but uh, I mean, we get a fairly good idea early on about what this film's going to be like when they have the first kind of encounter with uh, stock footage of animals. So they've got lovely stock footage of wolves, which is quite grainy, and they've got the howling and everything. Uh, and and all the mm -hmm. all the actors are like, oh my god. There, there's there's definitely tension in the air from hearing these wolves, <laughs> and then it cuts to them, and they're clearly being, uh, you know, savaged by very friendly German shepherds who look absolutely nothing like the wolves that have just been in the stock footage. Yeah, I know they're so cute. <laughs> you can see their tails wagging as they they kind of uh, bound up to I these know. actors, and they're trying to pretend that they're being horribly attacked. At least dogs are kind of wagging their tails. Yeah, and, it's, <laughs> and playing. I know. Oh dear. Yeah, that that was that sort of told us where it was going to go. So we got wolves and dogs, so that's great. What else do we have? Lots of kind of random goats and sheep, wild goats, wild sheep. Mm -hmm. I think actually we get a, sh a shot of a North American mountain goat at some point. They have these very yeah. weird uh, square heads. Uh, you don't get them uh, mm -hmm. in other places. So that's another kind of out of place animal, like a, a new world. Uh, I don't know what are goats? They're oval caprines. A, a new world's uh, artiodactyl in, in what is supposed to be an old world setting. Uh, what else do we see? Lots of what. What really bugged me was that the there's lots of shots of herons, and I think it took me like quite a few times for anyone. What the fuck is with all these herons? That there there's like some kind of metaphor for uh, romance or something. So every time herons appear, it's Thank when there's you. supposed to be kind of. Uh, a kind of loving interaction between all these terrible uh, kind of prehistoric people. And so, like Kim was saying, when the, what I've got in my notes is new girl, the homo sapiens girl that takes a liking to the uh, homo sapiens guy, uh, when they're, um, you know, when he's jabbing her with a spear to, to kind of encourage a bit of foreplay, um, it cuts to a really long scene of herons mating. But what's really annoying mm -hmm. is that it's different kinds of herons. So there's there's blue herons and grey herons and other kinds of herons. And also they, they overdub them with what seems to be seagull noises. It's not <laughs> it's not the noise that herons make, I'm pretty sure. 
A, a There's grass. other birds in this movie too, where they cut from one bird sitting on a tree to a bird taking off into flight, which is a different bird. Like the mm-hmm. birds are just sort of random. Yeah. Uh, and also, actually, here's another one. There's lots of, of points where you hear the uh, the call of a kookaburra, that kind of laughing. Yes, sound. I noticed that too. Um, but ju- and that's really common are, in movies to make them sound sort of uh, a little bit foreign. Just add the kookaburra sound, and which is an Australian bird. So that's another consonant yeah. we can tick off our list. Uh, there's there's shots of a fox <laughs> with a wolf howling. Did you guys see that? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, there's beavers as well. I mean, that could be that could be American or European, I suppose. Uh, there's something like a, a possibly a. a Rose shouldered crow, which is a um, hmm. a Cuban bird. I can tell you this one. These are these are North American birds. There was a, a red bird, which is called a scarlet tanager, hmm. uh, which is North American. And uh, the the one you're thinking about is a red winged blackbird. We have That's those it. around here. Okay, uh, I really like them. They're like a black bird with a red and a yellow stripe on their on their shoulder. Hence the name. Uh, the males are yeah. The females are just brown, but. Um, those are a really common bird around here. They like to live in the reeds and the ditches. So as you're driving along the highway, you just see them flying along beside the highway. I uh, One of my favorite birds around here, actually. Cool. But uh, North American birds, for sure. Definitely not European. And, and blue herons, you don't get over here, I don't think. We, get, we have gray herons and various species of egret, but we don't get blue herons in the old world, as far as yeah, I know. Yeah, we get blue herons here. Blue herons are pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of... Uh, Biogeography. There's also a monkey. Yeah. Oh, the I think it's a, a vervet monkey. Is it not a langer? Oh, is a it? A vervet, yeah. Or oh, a vervet. I thought it was. It reminded. I, I looked it up I as well. It was a Let me just have a look. Either way, not a European monkey, but a lot of people don't know that there were mm-hmm. monkeys in Europe during the Ice Age. Yeah. Uh, they sort of gradually go extinct as the Ice Age goes on, but they would be macaques or other extinct monkeys that are sort of similar to macaques or baboons but uh mm-hmm. not not the vervet monkey or whatever it is that we see there yeah i'm pretty sure it's a langer not not a vervet which is uh, uh an asian mm-hmm. species a little bit closer than a vervet monkey then possibly uh i don't really know the distribution of monkeys during the ice age in europe even though i have published on a monkey fossil from europe <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's pretty rubbish. Um, I've got lots of notes, but it's just all these guys fight with these other guys, but there's an ambush, <laughs> and then they return, and then they fight some more. Uh, we can talk about bears more, because yeah. the 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 movie is... It says in the voiceover at the beginning that all of the different tribes worship the bear, which uh, connects up to a real idea from the time, which mm-hmm. was that there were these uh, cave bear cults, which is what Clan of the Cave Bear is based on, right? It's mm-hmm. based on this... Um, these finding of cave bear bones and skulls in these caves across Europe that people interpreted as being positioned in a ritual way. Like, there's one site where the skulls are positioned in seemingly a circle and it seems like the people might have been doing something with them uh and we talked about this in our clan of the cave bear episode way back i think it was episode six yeah certainly certainly my understanding is a lot of that uh early work has been kind of discredited and the 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 cave bear placements are just artifacts of taphonomy so how they've been preserved like they the bones preserve better in kind of wall alcoves when they get washed there because then they're kind of safe out of the way of stuff um, or, you know, if there's a flood, mm-hmm. then all the bones will gather up together and look like they've been kind of ritually deposited and stuff like that. That's not to say that mm-hmm. there's not definite evidence that certainly, uh, modern humans had relationships with bears. So there's lots of bear art, bear amulets, um, uh, bear paintings, bear carvings and stuff. Um, but there's also the same for lions and for moose and for lots, lots of the other big animals of that time period. Um, but as far as I know, there's no evidence that neanderthals had any kind of close relationship with with the bears at the time and of course there would have been multiple species so cave bears brown bears uh, different species of cave bear because there's they're not just one they're more like a species complex um even the occasional polar bear possibly coming down from from the uh, sea ice Oddly enough, the other movie that this movie made me think of was Brother Bear, because we have the bear totem, 
We have <laughs> the wall where everybody gets to put their handprints. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, just Brother yeah. Bear, but from the evil human's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yes. That's a good point. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if the makers of Brother Bear saw this and were inspired. I don't know. God. Because they also did just keep bugging the bear. Yeah. The bear never came to them, right? Totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'd think they'd give it a bit more respect if they, they kind of worshipped it so much. But no, they're always there they just kept wanting to poking fight it. it. Yeah. And wanting to wrestle it. <laughs> It um, we could talk sweet. about the uh, <laughs> we could talk about the cave painting a bit because there is cave painting. There is a wall full of handprints, which is based on a real real thing. We do find handprints. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of blue pigments and a lot of bright mm -hmm. primary colors, mm -hmm. which are not very realistic. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's interesting. I noticed with the the uh, wall of hands, some of them were silhouette and some of them were imprint, uh, which yeah. which which is, I guess, true to form. I don't know if they're found in the same places, but certainly there is um, kind of uh, silhouette handprints where you put your hand on the wall and then blow the paint over it and it leaves a kind of shadow. And there's also the kind that they had in this film where they put the paint on the hand and then stick it on the wall too. But have we talked before about how uh, it's a bit weird with all the handprints that quite a lot of them are missing, look like they're missing fingers and... Uh, and stuff like that. I can't remember. My colleagues just wrote a um, a paper on that, which I'm sure you've read. <laughs> <laughs> I read a. Um, you read, I read the abstract. abstract. <laughs> I read the title. <laughs> I think I read like a draft of it a couple of years ago. Um, oh, I don't remember what they said. Mm. Oh, okay, let me find it. You guys keep okay, going, we'll and just I'll talk find about it ourselves. Said. But yeah, I think I mean there's <laughs> there is this. I think there's definitely been discussion about whether it's that, that, that really there is given that these people are working with really sharp flint and wood and other kind of things that will cut you quite badly, whether there's just that much amputation of fingers in the Paleolithic or whether it's some kind of uh, signaling device and that, you know, if you put down one of your fingers or, you know, you can leave a message by the, the kind of number of fingers that you leave up and, and leave down. I don't know. Is it like your signature? So, this person is, you know, index yeah. finger half down. <laughs> that person is no pinky. I don't know. So they, what they said is um, there's compelling evidence that these people may have had their fingers amputated deliberately in rituals intended to elicit help from supernatural entities. Hmm. So that's... But I haven't read the paper. That's the gods as Yakuza hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. So he says that quite a few societies encourage fingers to be cut off today and have done so throughout history. So I guess there's ethnographic mm. data to back that up too. Yeah, because it's an, an abnormal amount of them with the missing and all the same finger, right? Their ring finger. Hmm. I think. That is probably your... What is your least useful finger? Is it the ring finger? Or is it the pinky? If you had to nope. choose. <laughs> I don't know. I have a really small pinky so it's not really... like. Do we, do we use your pinky a lot? Right hand or left hand? I play guitar. I wouldn't want to lose any on my left hand. <laughs> mm, hard to say. Because the pinky could be a good, like, foundational base, right? Yeah. But mine mm -hmm. is so small. <laughs> like, my my little toe, I can't even move. There's just nothing there. It's just, like, an idea of a toe. Just a nub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I got a couple of more things that I think were inspired by real life in this movie. So, or possibly uh, retroactively inspired by real life. Uh, the first one is that um, when she finds, when the Neanderthal girl finds our protagonist early in the movie, he's suffering from a leg wound, which is somehow making him go unconscious. Uh, and she treats it with uh, a poultice that she makes out of chewing up leaves. And we now have evidence that Neanderthals did use plants for medicines in a lot of different ways. So there's a, a skull that has a, an abscess tooth, and uh, they, they determine lots of stuff these days from uh, DNA from uh, dental calculus. You can mm -hmm. learn about the oral microbiome and also the types of plants and things that people were eating because the, their DNA gets trapped in the, in the tartar on the teeth. Uh, mm. And so it seems like this guy was treating his tooth abscess with uh, poplar bark, 
which has a uh, salicylic acid in it, like uh, uh, the same ingredient, the same, yeah, the same uh, component in uh, aspirin. Mm. So he's like chewing up the bark and sort of packing his tooth with it to treat the pain, probably. Uh, there's also, I don't know how strong this evidence is of uh, penicillin. Uh, there's like DNA from penicillin mold in the tooth uh, calculus, which could be just a coincidence from eating bad food. Mm. Uh, but the idea of Neanderthals having like a plant-based traditional medicine and like knowing the properties of plants and how to treat wounds would be, uh, you know, true to life. Uh, particularly, like you said, you've been talking about mm -hmm. uh, amputations. Neanderthals have a lot of healed trauma, including a burial from Shanidar, who has an amputated arm and uh, it's healed. So these people clearly survived pretty severe wounds where they they must have had some way to to treat them to prevent infection and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, realistic. I don't know if there was really evidence of that at the time. Although, I mean, there was trauma because Shanidar, the Shanidar burial uh, was known at the time. It's so interesting that they had the Neanderthals portrayed as people that had, you know, clothing and medicinal knowledge of, you know, plants around them and, a, you know, kind of a singular religion shared among different groups on all this stuff, but still didn't really quite stand upright and just hooted like chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They didn't seem to talk or have a language or anything like that. They could make shoes. An but interesting they couldn't, choice. They couldn't talk about shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the language is actually really important in the movie because that voiceover at the beginning says that everybody lived it kind of says that they lived in harmony, except that obviously not because they're always fighting. But everybody lived together and shared a, the a same belief in like, worshipping the bear. Uh, but the most important thing was language, because the ones that weren't able to communicate with language couldn't adapt and went extinct. That's what the voiceover basically says at the beginning. So the mm -hmm. Neanderthals don't mm -hmm. have language, but the modern humans, it seems like some of them communicate with gestures and like our main character has words even though not many he has his own name which he can try and tell everybody which i don't know how effective it is to have a name for yourself if nobody can speak words <laughs> <laughs> but he also has a word for bear i think that he's using the word oros for bear did you guys notice that uh, he definitely seemed no, to be speaking like more than just he seemed to be speaking in sentences at some point but there was no indication of what he was actually trying to say i thought like he, he mm -hmm. talks in sentences to mm -hmm. the Neanderthal girl and at other points as well, but you've got no. There's no kind of subtitling or anything that would give you an idea of what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the implication is that they're saying modern humans evolved language, and that's why everybody else went extinct because the ones who could communicate with spoken language were the most successful. But they don't really do a great job of that in the movie. It's just really annoying listening to everybody go, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> it also didn't really seem to be where the movie was going. Like, it didn't end with them wiping out Neanderthal groups or anything, right? Like, it was just very one-on-one, -on -one small group violence. Uh, yeah, as the only person that watched this at, at one time speed, this was almost as bad <laughs> as, as uh, Return of the King for, oh, is it is this the end? Oh, oh no, there's a bit more. Is that, oh no, there's some more. Like I thought it was going to end when when the Neanderthal girl got speared and then uh, and they'd eaten all the brains yeah. and everyone was great. But no, it went on even longer. Uh, and you had the bear being killed and the head cut off. <laughs> and then you have the creepy old guys watching the uh, Homo sapien girl giving birth between some birthing poles. <sighs> You've got uh, the new baby getting kind of lion kinged up to the 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 sun <laughs> in the morning uh and then you've got a spaceship Which, countdown at mean? the end what does that tell us nah. it's art yeah that's it <laughs> it doesn't have to explain anything it's just art i didn't get that she was giving birth because i didn't notice she was pregnant i thought they were torturing her <laughs> she didn't look pregnant at all it comes yeah no. she's she's not she doesn't have a belly um i forgot that time had passed but you know there's a winter montage which is where a lot of the animals come in there's a montage where winter passes and then it just keeps going and like i forgot mm. that happened because it <laughs> happens in about 30 seconds and she doesn't look pregnant but just suddenly she's like oh i'm giving birth now and i'm like i thought this has been happening across three days this whole movie <laughs> 
Um, can we talk about the birthing poles? This standing birth where she's tied mm. to poles. Yeah, that's yeah. horrible. With creepy guys just watching and saying nothing. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I don't think there'd be any reason. I don't. I can't think of any ethnographic. Maybe there is, but I mean, generally, women the most comfortable position is squatting, right? Even mm-hmm. laying down is not. Is that's a westernized idea that's just come about hospitals I, I thought that the i don't think standing with your arms tied yeah i don't think they they didn't need to tie her hands i mean she could have just held on by herself <laughs> if she wanted to but i think there is mm-hmm. a, a bit mm-hmm. of ethnographic evidence for sort of standing or, or sitting like helping using gravity um to help in the birth process yeah, and squatting, actually using right? kind of things like birthing poles so, or birthing seats but not standing straight up like stretched out like no. you're being tortured like there's no. To certainly. have like the canal even. And not tie it up. Being tied up is the weird part of it, I think. Yeah. I think that was just yeah. for the creepy guys. But even uh, like, to have the canal come out mm. potting his butt. <laughs> like there's less kinks in the pathway if you squat. Uh-huh. Um ha- let's see, does this movie pass the Bechtel test? Looking up a diagram. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> Women don't speak to each other. Does it pass the Bechtel test? I don't know. Nobody speaks no. to anyone. We have There's two, no language. It doesn't. Well, no. yeah, that's a problem. To to strictly pass the Bechdel test, you have to actually be able to, to speak words. Uh, but in the spirit of the Bechdel test, we have two women characters, uh, and we have lots of women and actually children, which is a nice thing in this movie, because mm. children are often invisible in these caveman movies. But we've got lots of women and children. we got a brutal woman and child murder early at the beginning mm. of mm. the movie. Yeah, that was shocking. I, I don't think so, because the women... Even when they're together, like at a camp or something, they don't seem to even look at each other, right? There's no interaction. Yeah. Really, if there's any they're, interaction, it'll be about their the Homo sapiens. Focus is the man. Yeah, yeah. Um, we do have several women uh, helping out with the birth, uh, mm. which uh, you know could help. Except that when the child is born, it's immediately given to the man who carries it through the middle of a battle to hold it up like mm-hmm. the Lion King. <laughs> Yeah. After giving it some bear's blood uh, on its, yeah, dripping some bear blood right. on it. Yes, of course. Gross. Uh, another thing that I think is inspired by real life is when the Neanderthal girl dies, they give her this elaborate uh, burial or an elaborate cremation where they cover her in plants and flowers and then somehow light mm-hmm. all these green plants and flowers on fire. <laughs> and float her down the river, like Viking style. And float her down the river. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I, I think this is probably inspired by Shanadar as well, because yeah, uh, there is a burial number four from Shanadar, uh, which was excavated in 1960, which inspired a book called Shanadar, the First Flower People, where uh, they they found a lot of pollen in this burial, and uh, they found it in like clumps. So they interpreted it at the time as being flowers that were deposited with the burial directly. Uh, and so this changed the interpretation of Neanderthals at the time because people thought they were not very human-like. Uh, but it led to the idea that they were burying each other because it was a real, it was definitely a burial. And then uh, putting flowers in the burial as well to sort of, you know, symbolize some sort of afterlife or mm-hmm. treatment of the dead or something like that. Mm. Uh, but I think there's problems with the interpretation that the pollen came from actually putting flowers in the burial. Uh, and I was just reading a paper that came out in 2023. I was reading the abstract of a paper that came out in 2023, <laughs> uh, which interpreted that the pollen actually, uh, it's in clumps in some cases. So like there's pollen all over the place. You always find pollen in soil, but the idea that it was in clumps was interpreted as being actual flower heads in the burial. Uh, but there's evidence that the the pollen in the clumps comes from more than one flower so if the if the clumps actually were from a single flower head they should only have one type of pollen and so the interpretation is actually that they came from bees and that there are uh bees that burrow in the soil and so the bees would have multiple different uh types of pollen on them and then they bury in the soil and then if they die in their burrows they get mixed up when you dig the the grave and deposit it back, and then the bees decompose, but the pollen remains in a little clump. Mm. So I don't know if that's direct evidence, but it's 
possibly a better interpretation, a better explanation for how you have multiple pollens as a single clump. Interesting. Yeah. Unless it's a bouquet. Because there's a, there are the newest yeah. Shanadar, uh, Shanadar 9 or Shanadar 10, they, um, they interpret the way that it's laying to have been also intentional burial. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, the burials are intentional so, at Shanadar, right? Well, I mean, that was still up for debate. But in the last few years, it's I think it's been pretty well accepted that they're intentional. So if they are intentional, then that could at least lend some support to the idea that the flowers were put there. It's a nice idea. Yeah. I like it. I wish that they could show it with a bit more evidence. Maybe we're applying too much of our own sentiment that flowers are meaningful. Maybe they were actually burying them with bouquets of bees. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Honey for the afterlife yeah. could be. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, one last thing in my notes that I want to get to. I actually have lots of things I wanted to talk about for this movie, even though it was not a very good movie. Um, they use jawbones as weapons, which we've talked about before. I think mm-hmm. it might have been one million years BC or something where they're using jawbones. And we're like, why are they using jawbones? This wouldn't be a good weapon. In particular, mm-hmm. because when you're holding like uh, like these bovid jawbones where they've got sort of a nice handle between in the diastema between the incisors and the premolars. But when you're holding it that way, the part that you'd actually be hitting with is the condyle, uh, which is the the part that makes the joint, which would probably be like one of the weaker parts of the jawbone, which would probably break pretty easily when you hit somebody with it. And we're trying to figure out why they're always using jawbones in movies. I think I figured it out. I don't think there's any evidence in the archaeological record of using jawbones. Do you guys know anything about that? Like, no. I've never seen it. No. It comes from the Bible. Yeah. That's the the story of Samson in the Bible. With a donkey's jawbone, doesn't it? Uh, he kills yeah. a bunch of people. So the story is Samson. Samson's the guy whose strength came from his hair. There's a story in the Bible that he killed a thousand people with the, the jawbone of an ass. And that's got to be hmm. it, because where else does anybody use a jawbone as a weapon, right? Yeah. And in I Supernatural. Guess if, if we're going to just... In Supernatural? It, the logistics. Um, you know, it must be quite easy to get hold of a cow's uh, jawbone. You just go to any any butcher and they'll give it to you for probably yeah. nothing. But there's other bones that are better or better yeah. weapons. Like they use the tibia. Tibia yeah, they, are they, better they, they, they use the tibia and that, that would probably be a decent mace. Yeah. So, so there were a lot of people using bones as clubs in this movie and a lot of people using jawbones as clubs and the, the hero at the end is using a jawbone as well except he's using a pig jawbone mm. at the end. Mm. Uh, everybody else is using a bovid jawbone. A pig jawbone wouldn't be as good because it doesn't have that diastema to make a good handle. Yeah, you'll have a, a canine like digging into your palm. <laughs> yeah, we also never see pigs or cows in this, right? <laughs> <laughs> True. The uh, the bovid jawbones or you know whatever they are, uh, I guess they could be. Well, the goat jawbone would be quite small. It wouldn't really be, make a big weapon. So they they must be using actual cow jawbones yeah. as props in the movie. And then. Yeah, when he's using the the jawbone at the end, that's that's after they've upgraded their bola technology to fire bolas and throw them yeah. at, <laughs> at all these uh, all these uh, attackers. Every bola throw is a perfect neck shot, yeah. right? Every single one chokes <laughs> yes, somebody to death. <laughs> but they don't go on fire. I mean, these things, the bolas are on fire, <laughs> and then obviously, as soon as you throw them, that's going to put the fire out. So it's really a waste of time. There's there's a lot of things that like. There's a lot of things that go nowhere in this movie. Like mm-hmm. they light their bolas on fire, but then the fire has nothing to do with the way they win the battle in the end. I would even go as far to say that the movie goes nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. All right. So this movie has 3.8 out of 10 on IMDb. Uh, but there is one very glowing review, uh, which <laughs> I would like to to read you part of uh, and suggest that maybe you just don't understand this movie, okay? The the, the title of this says, probably the best admit, caveman... I did not understand this movie. <laughs> <laughs> the, title is, the title of this review is probably the best caveman slash primitive mankind film out there, and it gives, it gives it an 8 out of 10. What? And it finishes uh, this quite long review by saying, not a mindless movie, but a thought-provoking one requiring some semblance of intelligence, at least a hair above yeah. a primitive. So maybe we're just not smart wow. enough to understand this movie. Obviously yeah. not. And that was obviously written by the writer, director, That's producer. the director, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
I, I mean, you got to think about the symbolism. Those herons, the, the people have sex and then it cuts to herons yeah. having sex. So the birds having sex symbolizes the humans having it. sex. I, I mean, there's some deep symbolism. I don't get it. I mean, that's just too <laughs> highbrow for me. <laughs> <laughs> Should we talk about the soundtrack a bit? The soundtrack was oh yeah, this interesting. This review loves the soundtrack. Mm. The review says you don't if you want a generic Hollywood soundtrack that has like good orchestras and sounds like every other movie, then maybe this movie yeah. isn't for you. <laughs> but if you like synth. Uh, then mm. this is a great soundtrack. It, it yeah. did get quite annoying that just the same kind of six or seven notes <laughs> repeated over and over again on the synth. Uh. Yeah, yeah. If you love ambient synth <laughs> mixed with chimp noises mm -hmm. <laughs> for an hour and forty-seven minutes. Yeah, I think uh, what was it three point eight out of ten is definitely a a generous rating. It's high. That's yeah. very high. Yeah. I think it has 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. I can guarantee you it's 9 o'clock right now. By 9.40, I will forget this movie existed. <laughs> Thankfully. Yeah. i got to love my brain that way sometimes. <laughs> so it's not helpful for when I need to remember important things, but... <laughs> it has its benefits, I guess. I thought that the, um, <laughs> yeah. the actresses were interesting. The actress that played the uh, Neanderthal girl... She had really interesting eyes. They were kind of almost amber colored. I don't know if that was contact, if that was a deliberate style mm. choice, or if that was just her natural eye color. But that was that was interesting. And the actress that played the Homo sapiens woman that, that gave birth at the end, she had face paint on, which made it look like she had uh, yeah. a bit of LIGO. Um, mm -hmm. Sort yeah. of that kind of symmetrical uh, facial markings, which was also interesting. So uh, uh, at mm -hmm. first I thought it was actually Vitiligo that they were presenting, but then it, it washed off later on. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, it looked, it looked kind of cool. Mm. The other women helping her give birth had a similar face yeah. paint on as well. Yeah. Mm. It was like a less well-written, less well-thought-out Clan of the K-Bear with really poorly developed characters and an even bigger asshole as yeah. the... And a lot of kind of nonsensical stuff okay. in it as well. Like... Uh, the, the, there's a scene where they're they're sheltering in a cave, and there's lots of stock footage of. Are they? I don't know. Were they trying to make it look like there was an eclipse, and then there's like a forest fire, and then it, it kind of goes disappears, <laughs> they and they get out of the cave. Of the night. Yeah. And there's and there's no actual kind of damage. Everything looks like it hasn't been touched by fire. Yeah. And are they just afraid <laughs> yeah. of night? That was I kind of know. what I was suggesting, which was weird. Yeah. Uh, and there's also. I, I thought they were afraid of night, and I thought that's where the movie was going to go but then it just daylight came and nothing came of it yeah. yeah which was weird and then there was a bit where uh it looked like the the Andrew girl it cut from a scene where she was with she'd like run away with the homo sapiens guy then it cut back to her tribe and somehow she was still back with them like i don't know if that was like a an editing <laughs> I, okay, error that happened <laughs> i know i thought maybe i missed it it yeah. seemed like they were Always running away, but also just around the corner from yeah. her tribe, right? Like some kind of editing yeah. mistake, and they just, ah, uh, nobody will ever notice. Who's going to watch this? No one. <laughs> <laughs> but the forest fire scene was really long, and then mm. it never mattered. No, it was just filling space. And yeah, somehow, the, I think it's pretty soon after that scene, you see the modern uh, Homo sapien with this slingshot trying to hunt. I think it's a pika, like a small um, kind of... Mm rodent uh rabbity kind of thing uh, which is only found in mm -hmm. i think europe i don't think you get pikas anywhere else anyway um he he's really rubbish with his slingshot he doesn't even manage to hit it and yet soon after that he's able mm -hmm. to throw the bolas and get instant kills on all these people with his uh his headshots <laughs> the love of a good woman well i guess two good women <laughs> two good women yeah uh, <laughs> a modern and a neanderthal because that's the only thing, is he would have been dead without the Neanderthal woman. Yeah, right? he treated her really badly and uh, ditched yeah. her as soon as he could for, for his uh, Homo sapiens lady. And then she gets yep. stabbed by one of the assholes that... that, she, that was it, it wasn't the one that she saved, it was some other guy who... Yeah. I have no idea. She, she was trying to save the bear skull, the bear head, from being stolen. Again? Yeah. No idea. Yeah. None of it makes any sense. It kind of reminded me of that game, like Capture the Flag, where everybody has their flag and you have to try and find it. 
Someone, That's what the bear sculpting reminded me of. Totally. Someone needs to dub Yakety Sax over the top of it and just ha- speed it up so they're all running around <laughs> with the with the bear head. <laughs> <laughs> when we were young playing that game, the Find Your Flag game, we used we we're out at the cabin with my cousins and my sisters, and so we had different teams. And the other team's flag was just my, one of my mom's like white first aid cloth things. And we were playing all day and we could not find it. And they were winning and they were bugging us. And they were the older, I think it was my older sister. And we were just getting annoyed and we didn't want to play anymore. So I just went into the first aid kit and got the other one and just pretended that we found it. <laughs> <laughs> so that cloth is still out there somewhere. That's it. Uh, you know, lateral thinking, yeah. that's how you win. Yeah. And did they buy it? Did they? they oh, oh, she found it. Yeah. Great. Yeah. There you go. I don't... If they're listening to this, this will be the first they know of that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, anything else to say about Master of the World? No. Nope. It was it was rubbish. Yeah. Or was it a very deep and artistic and thought-provoking look at human nature? No. Yeah, I'm just not deep enough to get it. <laughs> Or sophisticated <laughs> enough. But the ending, he holds up the baby like the Lion King, and then there's the voiceover, which sounds like the countdown for, you said a spaceship, but I think yeah. it's supposed to be like a nuclear bomb. Oh, it's right. It's like war <laughs> in the Stone Age, war in the present day, and we're just exactly the same. We're just a warlike people. Mm-hmm. Give us a cow's jawbone and we'll be bashing people left, right, and center. Mm-hmm. See, it's deep. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You have to be you have to be really deep to suggest that humans are just bad, right? Yeah, that, that's something that yeah. not many people have ever thought. No, no other Stone Age movie we've ever reviewed has had the message that humans are bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something we do have to talk about before we we go is th- the bear, who is I think the star of the film. He definitely had mm. the same dubbing as Chewbacca. He didn't sound like a bear. He sounded like Chewbacca. <laughs> yeah he did did you notice that like Poor thing. Was, uh, yeah one of the uh, imdb reviews picks up on that as well it says that uh, <laughs> one of the not glowing reviews says that the bear sounds like chewbacca <laughs> i'm, I'm <laughs> like 99 percent certain they've just stolen chewbacca's dialogue from star wars okay. and dubbed it over the bear well where does chewbacca's sound come from well parts of it's bear but it's mixed in with other stuff as well i think there's walrus in there and uh and various other things. We should maybe look that up. It's probably just some guy that's really good at the Chewbacca impression. They were like, oh yeah. man, you should do that as the bear. So bears, walruses, lions, badgers, and other animals is what it says it's made from. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm reading as well. Badgers. Huh. Badgers are terrifying. Like, I don't know if you guys oh, yeah, have heard a scary. European badger, but mm. it sounds like a, a, it's the size of a bear if you hear one coming towards you at night. Mm. It's like that, that honey badger don't care. Yeah, Eurasian badger don't care neither. <laughs> but I think the American badger is a, a very different animal. Um, it certainly looks a lot meaner. I don't know if it sounds a lot meaner. I think it acts It's super mean. Hmm. You do not want to run into one of them. I don't know which one is the bad. I don't know which species is the one that has like the house and the tree that invites you in for tea and all that. Like in that um, you know those books? The badger? There's like Oh, and like a cart- a the wind in the willows. Book. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 That was badger. Where'd they got that? From? That there yeah, he's, badger, got, yeah. he's got a house, but he he yeah, it's, it's the British badger with uh, Ratty and Toad and um, and his other and Mole his friends. Oh, okay, so it's the North American one that'll fuck you up. Yeah, it looks like it would as well. Whereas yeah. the Eurasian one looks quite cuddly, but sounds like it would kill you. <laughs> So uh, we haven't had any replies for our contest yet, which is fine because our the episode with the contest just went up like a day or two ago, so we haven't really had any time to get responses. Uh, but if you didn't listen to our last episode on Bill and Ted, we have a small amount of merch with uh, Screens of the Stone Age logos. They're uh, black t-shirts and sweatshirts uh, with uh, white Screens of the Stone Age logo on it. And on our Bill and Ted episode, we said we would have a contest to give away some of those shirts. 
And what you need to do to win is to find a mistake in one of our previous episodes, either something in the movie that is a mistake that we missed in our episode, or a mistake that we have said ourselves in one of our episodes. And so if you can catch any kind of a mistake, send us that correction either by email to screensofthestoneage at gmail.com or to social media. We are on Twitter and Facebook. Kim, you manage the Facebook, so hopefully you check the Facebook. I manage the Twitter. And we've got a Blue Sky account. No, I don't know if I told you guys that, but uh, we finally got a Blue Sky code. So send us your mistakes. And if first come first serve whoever sends us the first mistake will win one of these shirts what did i say we've got we have a large sweatshirt crew neck sweatshirt a small crew neck sweatshirt and a medium t-shirt so uh if uh you can send us a mistake tell us which one you want and first person to claim each one of those will get it and i will send that out to you wherever you are in the world as long as i can mail it to you wherever you are If you've been enjoying Screens of the Stone Age, get in touch with us. Follow us on Twitter at SOTSA underscore podcast and on Facebook at SOTSA podcast. Or send us an email to screensofthestoneage at gmail.com. Screens of the Stone Age is supported by the Paleoanthropological Society of Canada. Find out more at pasc-scpa.ca.